Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Wilson, Technical Fellow for Cybersecurity Engineering at Motional. This presentation will cover cybersecurity requirements taxonomy-based threat modeling. The bulk of the information that I present is complete, documented, and has a bow on it. This talk is different. The material I'm going to present will cover emerging technology that we're still working on. It's important enough that we're sharing it as it covers a conceptual framework applied in a way that hasn't been done before. The talk is divided roughly into two parts. The first will cover what a cybersecurity requirements taxonomy is, and the second, how it can be used as the basis for threat modeling. Before that, let's take a moment and establish some terms. The AVCDL uses terminology consistent with this threat modeling glossary diagram created by Stephen and Miguez. You'll note that it has two distinct halves, which are separated by the attack element. On the left, we have the structural form. On the right, we have the implication area. When considering threat modeling, what we deal with is fundamentally in the upper left region. We have the threat traversing a boundary interacting with an attack surface. That's what I'm focusing on today. If we were to continue downward, we'd see that the attack surface may possess vulnerabilities which are defects, and that's fine. But let's stay focused on the threats traversing boundaries. With the terminology out of the way, we'll dive right into the Cybersecurity Requirements Taxonomy, or CRT. The first dimension of the taxonomy covers the assets we're going to be dealing with. All the assets we care about fall into a set of classes. These classes can be assigned to one of three states. The first state is that of data at rest. In the context of data at rest, we have executables, which is any binary data that can be run in the system. It doesn't matter if it's software or firmware. Then we have configuration data. This is the data used to establish the personality of the system. This metadata tempers how the system behaves. Next, we have the two types of data stores. The first our databases, which is structured data, typically managed by specialized engines. And the second is unstructured data. This is everything that's not a database. There are two very specific types of data that we're going to call out regardless of how they're embodied. One is credentials. This is the data used to establish and manage identity of any entity within the system. And the other is logs. This is data used to record system events. Logs obviously decompose into an assortment of different types, and we tend to care about security logs because we're security focused, but other types of logs may also be considered here. In the category of data in motion, we care about PII and packets. We care specifically about PII because we want to ensure that we don't leak that information. As for packets, they're what we use to move the data around the system. And finally, we have data in use, for those of you watching side channel attacks. This is broadly speaking memory. This could be registers, it could be stack, it could be RAM, it's memory. It's the data actively being manipulated within an executing system. The second dimension of the taxonomy is that of cybersecurity properties. We've been talking about cybersecurity properties for a really, really long time. When asked what these are, everyone says the CIA. If you press for details, you'll probably hear mention of Salzer and Schroeder's work from 1975. This is in no way the first discussion of cybersecurity properties. We can trace things back at least to 1964 in a paper entitled On Distributed Communication, Security, Secrecy, and Tamper-Free Considerations. 
And just because we have the Saltzer and Schroeder paper doesn't mean that the discussion ended there. In fact, the CIA isn't even mentioned in the 1983 Department of Defense Trusted Computer Systems Evaluation Criteria, aka the Orange Book. Throughout the early 2000s, we've had an ongoing discussion of how the CIA is necessary but not sufficient. In fact, we can look at the end of the 2010s and see that we're still debating these. In 2001, NIST SP 800-33 introduced an underlying technical model for information technology security. From 833, we can identify seven cybersecurity properties, which are called out in the GRVA material that went into making UNR-155. That material referred to them collectively as the extended CIA. These are confidentiality, integrity, availability, non-repudiation, authenticity, accountability, and authorization. Together, I would argue that these are orthogonal. I don't know how many times I've seen people jumping through hoops of fire to try to make everything fit into the CIA alone. It just doesn't work. This is the resource access model that I've put together to provide a place to hang this discussion. At the center of the diagram, Going from top to bottom, we have a requester making a request to a resource owner. The resource owner performs an operation on the resource and then returns information to the requester. Additionally, the transaction may be subject to logging. Flanking this transaction on either side, we can see a schematic of the data flows. A request comes in has a source, destination, there's a payload, there's a check that may be present, that payload is a command with optional data, the command will either perform a write operation, in which case there's a data value coming in, or a read operation. This comes back as a write status or read data that goes into a payload, which forms a response. This is the working model for resource access. Now let's consider how cybersecurity properties might be applied to this diagram. If we applied only the CIA, we would cover the elements as shown here. The confidentiality, integrity, and availability are shown on the elements where controls would be placed. Note the number of places where we'd normally want to put controls, but that we're not covering. When we include the other properties, non-repudiation, authenticity, authorization, and accountability, we see that the previously unaddressed control points are now covered. If we bring asset and property together, we get a visualization like this. Now, work similar to this has been proposed in the past, but we're not quite done yet. So what's left? To answer that, we need to know what a threat model is and how we decompose the system. Let's start by addressing what a threat model is. A threat model can be considered a representation of a system's data flows, data stores, and interactors. Alternately, as a collection of system views. And finally, as an engineering design document. This may be the most important function it serves. But fundamentally, it's a model of a system that we can reason on with respect to cybersecurity. Here's a block view of a simple system. You'll note that this is not an automotive system, but it is a system that anyone can relate to. I would argue that it manifests all the behaviors that we care to model. On the right, you have an interactor, an administrator, who is interacting with the system via two modalities. The first is a web browser, and the second is a terminal. On the left, the system of interest, we have a web server, 
and a console interface that the administrator is interacting with. Both are communicating with the core service. That core service and terminal interface have configuration data and application data. We have multiple processes. We have read-only and read-write data stores. And we have different types of data flows. We can create a data flow diagram from the block view. All of those entities have a one-to-one -one correspondence within the DFD realm. Our boundaries can be simplified to just two. There's the core services boundary between the core service, web server, and the console interface. And then we have a machine boundary between the web server browser pair and the console interface terminal pair. One could argue that there's also a network boundary, but it's subsumed by the machine boundary. Now, if you look at this, you can say, yes, this is correct. But actually, there are pieces that are implicit but missing. Anyone who's done extensive threat modeling will appreciate the problem that this creates. In order to understand the problem, let's explore our DFD more. Missing from our original DFD was the operating system itself. These are the elements in red. The file system, database manager, interprocess communication manager, network manager, and serial driver. We tend to forget about these processes, all of which our first diagram conveniently ignored. You'll note that we now have many more boundaries than earlier also. But this diagram isn't a complete view either. The database manager has to work through the file system. The network manager has to talk to a network driver. We also have additional boundaries. The point is that as we create our models, if we don't take these elements into consideration, we're going to miss things. By the same token, if we only look at issues that exist at the highest resolution, we're going to miss issues in the end-to-end -end traffic. This is where the taxonomy's third dimension of layers comes into play. And here we can see that we have four layers. We have the physical layer, which is the actual hardware interface. The network layer, which includes all the system-mediated transports. The protocol layer contains custom data transports. And finally, the application layer, which is where data handling occurs within the executables. Now, from top to bottom, you go from no control to complete control. With network protocols, you don't get to decide what types of cybersecurity controls are in place. They're predefined, and you simply work with them. When you're doing custom data transport, you pretty much have full control over how the data goes back and forth. You may not know what to do with the data that you're sending, but you control how the data is moved from point A to point B. Finally, within an application, you have full control over the data, how you're storing it, and all the controls applied. So when we put these three dimensions together, we end up with the full taxonomy space. So now let's see how the taxonomy informs the cybersecurity requirements. We can create cybersecurity requirements based on the desired cybersecurity properties of an asset in the context of a particular layer. So for instance, within the application layer, we don't make any assertions about packets because packets don't exist in the application layer. Nor do we make assertions about authenticity or accountability for unstructured data. We do make assertions about confidentiality of configuration data. For each layer within the taxonomy, we create a set of assertions. From these, we can create requirements. Those requirements are not backward looking. They're not considering historic attacks and attempts to assert requirements to protect against them. The requirements are positive assertions of how we're ensuring 
cybersecurity properties are maintained. For instance, we can say that when we have an executable, we want to assert this cybersecurity property is ensured. That requirement will never change because it's fundamental. It's future-proof. Once you go through this exercise, you end up generating a global requirements catalog. All possible requirements go there. This is a portion of the catalog provided in the AVCDL. On the left-hand side, you have the ID and description. Following these are the property asset and layer, which each applies to. The catalog is only about 70 entries. Now compare that to the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Additionally, all the requirements are in COAST compliant. It's important to note that a requirement may fall into more than one location within the taxonomy. Now we can take these global cybersecurity requirements and for each of the functional requirements, create tailored requirements from them, and then create the augmented functional requirements. These are then used to drive the development stories and development tasks. Now you may say, you only have 70 requirements. You don't want to constantly be in a situation where you're applying dozens of requirements to individual functional requirements. And I absolutely agree. And what you do to address this is create macro requirements, which are then attached to the functional requirements. The macro requirement implements multiple tailored requirements in the same way that a functional requirement implements multiple technical requirements. As an example of this, we can look at SecOC. There are four requirements from the global catalog that SecOC provides coverage for. Credentials crossing trust boundaries are encrypted. Communication crossing trust boundaries ensures data integrity. Communication crossing trust boundaries ensures authentication. And custom protocols use current best practices for authentication and key exchange. We wrap those together and create a macro requirement named SecOC. Specifically, SecOC Security Profile 1. It's important to note that not all of the SecOC security profiles conform to all of these requirements, but Profile 1 does. So that's the requirements taxonomy and how we use it to build out our requirements. Now let's look at how we apply the taxonomy. We're going to use the Microsoft Threat Modeling tool as a basis because it's both freely available and highly configurable. So what we've done is strip the base template down to nothing and then develop a new set of attributes for each of the standard DFD entities, resource, process, interactor, boundary, and data flow. That allows us using these attributes to build up standard pieces for our use case, which is generally speaking automotive. Other use cases are certainly possible. We then took our requirements and rebuilt the rule set. Within the context of the Microsoft Threat Modeling tool, rules are applied when a data flow crosses a trust boundary. Rules can reason on the trust boundary, the data flow, the source, and the destination information. It's important to realize that not every requirement in the global catalog can be applied to threat modeling. In fact, only about a quarter of the global requirements lend themselves to treatment of this kind. It's important to recognize the limitations of threat modeling tools. They're not magic boxes. The important thing is that what we get out of this customized threat modeling tool is the ability to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between a rule and its mitigation. Typically, when you're using something like the Microsoft Threat Modeling tool, you're going to get generic mitigation recommendations that say, you are subject to some kind of attack. That's nice, but how does that help the developer make informed decisions as to what to fix? Since we use our requirements as the basis for the rules, any violation of the rule points back to a single requirement. So you don't get false positives. The only way that you would 
conceivably get a false positive is if you don't put all the data in that you need. The results you get are both very clear and very definitive. Because our categories use the cybersecurity properties as the classification instead of using stride, it's also much clearer as to what our concerns are. The question becomes, is this useful? The last thing we need is something that doesn't give us actionable information. And for individual tests that we've run, we see that when compared with using the baseline from the Microsoft Threat Modeling Tool, and then using the cybersecurity requirements, CRT as a basis, the latter gives us much higher quality output. Now you might say, well, you're applying a much smaller set of rules, so you're not covering all the cases. The thing to remember is that threat modeling does not address everything. Threat modeling is not performing attack surface analysis. Threat modeling can't reason on the metadata, i.e. the configuration that's used. For instance, if you're using encryption, it can't tell you that you're using the correct cipher suite. You may be using a null cipher suite, in which case encryption is completely pointless. That's something caught elsewhere. Finally, let's look at Stride versus the CRT. The focus of Stride is an attack-based one. The focus of the CRT is property-based. Stride values are not unique, they're not unambiguous, they're not complete, they're not grounded. There is no fundamental underpinning for Stride. It's an arbitrary collection of problem types. As anyone who's done threat modeling uses Stride knows, it does not scale well. And it's only actionable some of the time. Even with its smaller rule set, the CRT provides results which are always unique, they're always unambiguous because all the requirements are NCOS compliant, it's complete in that it covers all of the elements. It's well grounded. We have documentation providing a basis for all of our choices. It's scalable. Its behavior is well defined. And it's always actionable because all of the violations of the rules point to an actionable requirement that can be attached to a functional requirement. Where to go from here? As I said, this is a work in progress, and as we get further along, we'll release the material that we have on this topic. As you can imagine, testing a set of rules and then providing those tests so that we can assert that it's not just a magic box takes time. We want people to have a well-founded understanding of their threat modeling system and have assurance that the tests which verify the rules are correct. That's the goal. The video for this talk will be up on our YouTube channel alongside other material related to the topic, such as cybersecurity requirements taxonomy and cybersecurity requirements. Up on GitHub, you can find all the source and distribution versions of the AVCDL materials, including the source used to build this talk. And here are some references that were used in the context of this presentation for those of you interested in more detailed information on them. And now I'd like to open for questions.